So, you know, I wrote a book called Age of Context, and I'm interested in how businesses are going to deal with the coming flood of data, uh, some of which they already have, and sometimes you have to move that data from an old system in a t into a new system, and that's called data transformation. Uh, we're going to meet with uh, Trifacta right now, who is doing that in a new way and getting uh, p companies and people into the new data age. And we're going to learn about data science right now. Who are you? My name is Joe Hellerstein. Uh, my background, I'm a computer science professor from UC Berkeley. I joined up there in 1995 after doing a PhD and some time at IBM. Um, and in recent years, I founded a company called Trifacta, where I'm the CEO and the co-founder. It's a company I founded with a colleague from Stanford, Jeff Heer. Uh, Jeff's well known as the author of D3.js, which is a data visualization package. And he's a leader in the human computer interaction and data visualization space. My background's in database systems, distributed systems, and things like that. And then the third co-founder of the company is a guy named Sean Candell, who was our grad student at Stanford when we started the project. So very smart people. Uh, what is it that you guys do? Because m most of my audience doesn't deal with uh, big data and doesn't try to do data transformation and has no clue about what you're doing. And then some people are really highly uh, advanced and, and, and will understand what you're doing. How did you get into this and what, what does your tool try to do? Yeah, well, I can tell you a little story about how we got into it. So I've been interested in building systems for people to work with data. Uh, and for me, back in the 90s, and most people in computing thought data was the boring stuff underneath the computer. Um, by now, I think we all realize it's the reason for the computer. You know, data is the thing that upon which we compute is the thing we want to know about. Um, and as I sort of evolved through my career, I realized it's not just the back end, that really data is stuff that people work with. It's like a, a plastic medium, it's like clay. Um, and there's people whose job it is to work with data all day long. Yep. And that's only going to grow as we see sort of this uh, ecosystem of data evolve. Uh, in my book, I say there's two driving things for businesses. One, we need to know everything about everything. If you look at Uber, for instance, what is Uber? It didn't change the limo company. The driver's still the same. The car's the same. How they get paid is the same. The, the, you know, everything's the same. What changes the data about the limo? I get to see the limo driving toward me right now, right? And that's all Uber is, is data, right? That's right. Or that's the right. difference is data. That's the difference. And I think every business is going to be forced into this new world of understanding everything about everything. And then also understanding the customers in deep detail, which means a lot more data, too. That's absolutely right. And so it's all the activities people engage in. You point out Uber is the physical world and then online, of course, and we're going to see just a, prolifer a proliferation of this kind of thing. So this is all backed up by hardworking folks who are sitting around working with data. And when you look at their day and you say, how do you spend your time all day? You know, a bunch of these people have PhDs in statistics or mathematics. Some of them um, are developers. Some of them are sort of uh, data engineers. And what they'll tell you is they spend 80% of their day cleaning data. And they don't enjoy what do they it. mean by cleaning data? What does that mean? Um, kind of two facets to it. Um, one is data is often not structured in the right way. So and if you've ever used a spreadsheet, and there's like a little data over here, and there's another block over there, and it's, it's not quite the way you want it to draw a chart. And you have to go through this thing like, well, I'll copy this over here, and I'll paste it there, and I'll delete this, and finally you get to draw a chart. That's one piece of it, is that structuring. And you can imagine doing that on petabytes instead of on a spreadsheet. You've got to do it somehow programmatically. Uh, so that's one piece of structuring. And then the other is actually changing the content of the data. So I'll give you some examples. You might have codes that you have to translate into values. So you have to do lookups into some code book. Or you might have some things that seem like they're pretty much the same, but you're not quite sure if they're the same. So there's you know, different ways of naming a person, right? You've yeah. got to make sure that you get one copy of that customer instead of 17 copies of that customer. And that's, there's that problem. And then finally, if you're going to draw a chart of data and you want to do visualization and you've got a petabyte to start with, you're going to have to turn it into something much smaller before you can visualize it. So there's the transformation of data reduction is another piece of the puzzle. Wow. Yeah. So what does your tool help with in, in this uh, new world of having to clean up data and do stuff with data? Yeah, so well, I think where we came at the problem was we looked and we saw what are people using today to do this problem? What's their skill set? And where it comes down to is one of two things. One is the kind of spreadsheet case where they're literally manually cutting and pasting and moving data around. And that just doesn't scale up to big data. No. So it doesn't even scale up, frankly, to medium data. So people who are good at spreadsheets start writing macros. Okay, and that's really programming, it's coding. And when you look at big data, it's coding, coding, coding. And so you got these people who are data scientists, right, who are out there saying, uh, 
yeah, I'm going to go, I can do this, I'm uh, very technical, and they're spending their day doing stuff like moving data around, which just doesn't seem all that um, high tech somehow, and yet yeah. it's taken up all their time. We came with the problem, as we said, how can we make this experience very different and much more efficient and, and uh, uh, iterative so that people can kind of get in there and start playing with the data and have it be much more malleable, much more like working with clay on a potter's wheel than just trying to like, write a software program. Yeah. yeah. And so the way we looked at it was, this is a user interface problem. My background is, is systems and algorithms and all this kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, this is about people getting their job done, and you gotta look at the user experience. Yeah. So the analogy we made was, well, the graphical user interface came in in the 80s, or it really came from the 70s, but um, came in in the 80s into the market, and it made computers a thing that used to be operated by folks in lab coats to something where we carry them in our pockets, we use them all day long, yep. very mass market. Data today is operated by people in lab coats, right? So there's something about that user experience that we haven't cracked yet, and our software is trying to attack that problem. So we were looking at this in research at Berkeley and Stanford when we started the project with Jeff and Sean, and we realized that we had a handle on this problem where we could really go in and make a big difference. We built a prototype that's actually on the web called Data Wrangler that people played with, got a lot of nice feedback on it, and we took that and we're now commercializing it uh, in the trifecta context and adding quite a lot to it. Data is really uh, starting a change. Um, well, for instance, Union Pacific has sensors on railways, and they're getting 40 million sensor readings a day, right? So it's, a str it's almost like a stream. It's very different than the uh, relational data that we know about, you know, why Oracle exists, you know, uh, back in the 80s and 90s, where we w were really dr just trying to put customers and, and sales into a database so we could see uh, our businesses in a new way. Um, does, does this help us bridge those two worlds, I, I, I guess? Yeah, that's great. So uh, absolutely, and part of the work that led up to this company for me was the time I spent building things like wireless sensor networks that you could query and stuff like that. Uh, so it's stuff we, we've been doing for years. Um, as a technologist, I'll be honest with you, all the stuff under the covers, whether it's relational or whether it's map reduced, it's all the same. All that stuff is about taking large volumes of data and moving it around and putting it together and taking it apart. It's the programming models and the usage models where they really differentiate really at the, at the end of the day. Yeah. So um, that Oracle scenario you described, it's not that it's a relational database per se, it's that what we were doing with data back then it was very expensive, the machines were expensive, the software was expensive, the people were expensive. Let's get it to do something and let's get it to do something really important and let's get that right. So what the people in the industry used to call this is the single source of truth for the enterprise, yeah. okay? Well, when you're getting all this data and you have all this compute available to us now, you don't want a single source of truth. You want, it's like postmodernism. You want everybody to have their own view of the truth because what are they gonna do with this data? I don't know, something different than they did yesterday and it's gonna be really interesting and high value. So you're fostering creativity and whether it's in rows and columns in a relational database or it's in files in Hadoop, it's that activity that you're trying to foster that's so different from that very rigid, architected data factory that you used to have. Do, uh, to use Trifacta then, do, uh, do you make assumptions of, oh, you have a Hadoop cluster already built and ready to go, or, or does it help us uh, get a, a company into the new data world uh, you know, where the, they might not know yet what, what they're studying? You yeah. Know? I just, even an old company, right, uh, uh, Ritz-Carlton, uh, they're building new things to understand their customers better, and those new things might be in a MongoDB database, and the old things might be in an Oracle database, right? Yep, absolutely. So, uh, two pieces to that puzzle. The first was when you're taking the research off campus, what's possible? And the answer to that is all, all that stuff you described is possible. Then you have the business question of, okay, I'm building a business, I got a couple dozen guys in a room, what are we going to build first? And the answer to that question for us was Hadoop. And the thinking around that was relatively simple. Um, there is a new market emerging around a new tool chain, and all these new use cases are gravitating to that market. That's where the feet of the creative work is going. Yeah. And so technology being good or bad is irrelevant. That's where the work is being done. And that's where the growth is. So you, the yeah. de novo data is gonna grow with Moore's Law. The stuff you had last year is gonna be half of the stuff you have next year, et cetera. And so uh, for us, it was a very easy decision, Hadoop first which is not to say Hadoop only by any means, but Hadoop first. That said, early customers we have are taking COBOL data from mainframes, bringing it into Hadoop and then wrangling it. And so we're actually seeing legacy data, we're just seeing it in the Hadoop environment. That makes sense. Um, can we uh, see what, what it looks like? And, and then um, 
how much does this cost to buy? I, you know, is this is this something an individual developer can put on a credit card, or is it something that I, I need to go and convince a committee or a rack space to buy? <laughs> yeah, um, we're looking at the enterprise market first and really big data sets, and so yeah. we're going into deals where there's people deploying you know dozens, hundreds, thousands of nodes of Hadoop, and so we are looking at that use case first, and yeah, that's going to be more than you want to pay on your credit card. Yeah. Um, You'll see with the technology that it's very approachable, and I think as we roll out, we'll be able to move down market. But you gotta make a decision as a software company. Are you building something for the mass market and you're gonna price it low, or are you building something for you know, a smaller set of professionals? And we've chosen to go that second route first. Cool, so this is for a data scientist who works at Walmart or a big company. Yep. And uh, let's, let's see what let's we can do and, and how it forces them to think differently about their jobs, I guess. So the technology we're looking at is something we call predictive interaction. And the idea is going to be that uh, rather than writing code, we're going to let Trifacta kind of predict what code we want based on visual interaction. The data we're going to look at I got from City of San Francisco. It's restaurant data, and particularly with fun parts of it are restaurant violations. Ah. Yeah. So you're going to tell me where not to eat? Yes. <laughs> yes. We can mask out the restaurant names to protect the... Uh, the guilty. The hapless guilty, that's right. So we'll create a little project here and we'll call it Restaurant Violations. We're going to plug in a data set that I already loaded up into Hadoop, uh, which is the violations data for the, uh, restaurants in San Francisco, create the project, and crack it open in Trifacta's interface. What we're going to see in Trifacta is there's kind of two levels that analysts tend to operate at. There's the level of data and visualization, where you really have eyeballs on data, and then there's the level of code, where you're looking at stuff you know, that's much more technical. And traditionally what you do is you would write code and yeah. you would look at data and then you'd, you'd do a visualization to see if it looked right. We're going to have that be flipped around. You're actually going to interact with the visualization and the code's going to pop out the bottom. Okay. All right, so we're kind of flipping the paradigm. Cool. So this is the data. Trifacta took this raw file, went ahead and said, jeepers, I can add two steps to a script here. I can split it on rows by backslash r backslash n. I can split it on commas by on columns by comma, and then I get nice clean columns of data that looks kind of the same. And then I can actually already draw charts for it because this looks like numbers, okay? And we can get going. Now there's, there's stuff in here that's not right. Like notice there's dates that are in the comments, right? Yeah. The date the violation was corrected for these unclean integrated floors and ceilings was this. So let's just highlight that date. I'm interested in dates and the dates should have been pulled out. So we just highlight a date and Trifacta says, gee, I think you're trying to extract from column four a pattern the pattern is that exact string. And I say, no, Trifecta, actually, I want any kind of date. So here's another example. Please learn from my examples what I'm talking about. And now it says, oh, okay, are you saying you want to extract from column four after a space and before a space right bracket? And uh, I can look over here to preview, and I got a nice, it's already figured out that looks like times, you know, date times. Yep. And uh, there's a distribution of years here that looks reasonable. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm going to add it to my script. So now I got dates that the violations were corrected. There's dates over here too, mind you, that were in the data, and they're wrapped up in quotes that I don't like. So let me highlight a quote, and Trifact is going to say to us, gosh, are you trying to replace quote in column three with nothing every time it appears? And uh, that's what it would look like if you did. And I'm going to say, actually, I want to get in here, and, and I'll just edit this a little bit. I want to replace this not just on any one of the columns, but on all the columns. I'm going to get rid of quotes. Get a preview, looks right, hit return, adds it to the script down here, and uh, we'll keep going. Now our dates are not in a recognized format and we have these headers. So if you go up here, you can see there's valid values and there's invalid values that aren't numbers. That's from these, this header row. Yep. We can go in here and just kind of pick the header off the menu here and get that up in the, in the header. And that gets rid of those red bar marks. And then we can go clean up these dates, point at the place where you split years and months. And it says, are you trying to split a character four? Yes, I am. Uh, split this up into months and days, click there. Do I want to split that up that way? Yes, I do. And then I can put them back together into dates. And we'll do month, which was that one, and then maybe a slash, and then days, which was that one, and then maybe a slash. And you're seeing I'm getting a preview as I go. And then the year, which was day two. That is cool. And bang, we should now, oh, I left a comma out. We should now have what we're looking for. Great, so there's wow. dates. Here's where it gets fun, all right? All we did so far is clean up the dates and we can get rid of these columns, but here's where it gets fun. So you might say, oh cool, I got, you know, I got this stuff cleaned up, I could do some kind of time chart. But what I'm really interested in are these comments. If you crack one of these data sets open, you're like, what kind of bad stuff goes on in restaurants in San Francisco? Yeah. Uh, moderate risk vermin infestation. Wow, vermin, I like that. I'm gonna highlight the word vermin. 
and it's going to say, did you want to pull out the word vermin from all the comments? If you did, you'd get a column like this, which has got 395 occurrences of vermin out of uh, some 4,500. It's like 10% vermin. Like, okay, well, maybe it's 1% vermin. I'm bad with zeros. It's 10% vermin. So that's good. I'm going to pull that out, but rather than have it be the word vermin, I'll do a count of how many times vermin occurs. So we got ones and zeros. One for vermin, zero for no vermin. Yeah. So now I got the vermin count field, okay? And we're going to rename the vermin. And uh, hey, you know what else I want to pull out? I want to pull out stuff. I look at this, I say, there's a bunch of stuff about temperature, all kinds of different things about temperature. So there's temp, and there's hot. And probably, you know what, I'm going to go in here and just do this myself. There's also cold. probably cool, maybe cold, maybe refridge, refridge. And as you start typing this, you start getting examples. OK, this looks good. I'll hit return. Wow. Right? You can really see how somebody can work with data. And, and now data is really like plastic, right? And now what you can do is say, OK, fine. What I really want to know is how many times are there vermin versus, say, um, this last thing I did, which was description two, OK, um, grouped by the business ID. For each business, how many times did these occur? Bam. And now I can look at things with lots of vermin. All right. <laughs> and highlight that part of the field. We'll keep only the rows that have lots of vermin. Hit return. There's not that many of them. What are they? Well, it happens that I have a data set also that I've loaded, came with this from the city of San Francisco, that maps business IDs to names. So let's go look up who these guys are. We'll look it up. It's in the uh, SF businesses. We're looking up by business ID. Bam, execute the lookup. Here, my friends, in a moment, are the restaurants you do not want to eat at and their addresses. Uh -oh. OK? And I want to highlight here not so much that we found interesting things in data, which you can always do, but first of all, that it was almost all visual. Yeah. And second of all, that this data wasn't like this when it started. It said nothing about vermin. It said nothing about temperatures. That was something that we crafted out of the data, right? That we had to pull out of the data. And that's what I meant by there's not a single source of truth. There's whatever you can think of to do with this data. Um, that's what makes a data analyst get up in the morning, and that's a lot of the work that they do during the day. Now, is this, it, this data set is, is sitting on a Hadoop cluster somewhere else in the world, right? It's not sitting on your local machine. As it happens, uh, to avoid dealing with your wireless internet here, it's sitting on my local oh, machine. Okay. I have a gigantic Hadoop cluster in the box. <laughs> but the, the, would the performance be just about the same as if you had it up on the cloud somewhere? It would, actually, because the way we work with very large data sets, and this is you know, getting back to being a realistic technologist, if you give me a petabyte of data, it will take me a while to scan through it. I don't care how many machines you give me. It's going to take me a while. And so when you deal with very big data, you always want to pull a sample, manipulate the sample, Make sure you get it right on the sample and then run it on the full data set. Yeah. So when you have a really big data set, that's what we do. We pull the sample for you. And then if you say run job over here, you can run it in Hadoop. And yeah. it'll fire it off, send it to your cloud-based petabyte of data, execute it, and you'll get a report back when it's done. Oh, this is cool. Totally different than I was expecting, you know? Because it's not about bringing something in and into a new system and you know fixing it. This is really about thinking through data in a new way and it teaches you how to code as you play with it, right? It does. I'm glad you so brought that up. So you don't need up. to know how to code before you can even do anything. You just start playing, and it, you can see how the code works. And it, it, the type ahead code was pretty interesting. Yeah. And we talk about this. You know, When you saw me highlighting things, I was training a machine learning algorithm back there to uh, re recognize patterns. But the software also trains me because it, it shows me what the code looks like. One day I might just start by realizing that I can put you know, things between vertical bars to get hot or cold. And the next day I might figure out a little bit more that I can tweak. And it does take people up the learning path uh, much more quickly. Yeah. I'll point out something in the design that my colleague Jeff Hare brought up. We designed the language that we have down here, which we call Wrangle. Yep. Designed it to be readable. It's a language to be read, not to be written. So it's a programming language that was meant to be easy to read. Because most of the time you don't write it. Yep. You scan it and you're like, which one of these do I want? That one. Bam. When we started with it, we had a much more traditional programming language that had regular expressions, which are kind of the yep. bread and butter of what people do with this stuff. And if you show a programmer seven regular expressions, you say, which is the one you want? They don't know. They can't tell, even if they're good at writing them. It's a language made for writing. It's terrible for reading. And so we were very careful in crafting a language where the patterns that we learn and things, they're easy to scan with your eyeball and they're easy to read. Um, the, you know, if I'm playing with a system like this, I might want to build a mobile app that lets people visualize the data on their mobile phone. Do you, 
do you help me build APIs and, and interfaces to this data for an external developer, or, or is that outside the scope of this tool? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we have chosen um, to focus on our knitting here around this sort of manipulation of data. Um, you know, the analogy again to clay and the potter's wheel. We're the potter's wheel, we're not going to be the kiln, we're not going to be the glaze, right? And the reason for that is there's, there's great stuff out there to do data visualization, to do exploratory analysis of structured, cleaned up data. Once you pulled out all those features, you know, vermin and all that. Um, I'll point out that, you know, Jeff Hare, my colleague, and Sean were working at Stanford in their visualization group. That's the same research group that gave birth to Tableau. We think Tableau is a great piece of software. There's other similar pieces of software like ClickView. Really nice for playing with data. There's really no reason for us to go reinvent that stuff. This stuff's great. So we team up with those guys. And um, I think similar thing for building apps and APIs. There's a lot of tooling around that that really is quite good. A bunch of it comes from open source, actually. And it's developer-centric. Um, and that side of the equation is sort of a different market. So yeah. we're just letting it lie. Do I need to do anything? If I have a Hadoop cluster already, do I have to do anything to the Hadoop cluster to get this to work? Or no, you I pretty much just point this at your Hadoop cluster. And, you know, like all software, there's a little bit of, mm, you have to get the screwdriver and, you know, kind of turn some knobs to point anything at anything with software. Yeah. But it is as simple as registering it with your Hadoop cluster and going. What else do I want? Uh, you know, I'm not a, a programmer or a, a technical person. What, what would a CTO be ne needing to know about your tool? It's, but, it's two things, and they're both pretty simple. The first thing is, in any large business, there are folks who do this every day. You've hired people to be your data people. Look at their day, look at their workflow, you will see it's very inefficient. And they're c crying out for better tools, no question about it. So that would be one thing that a CTO should look at, is look at your HR issue and try to make your people more efficient. The second is there's a huge HR gap for data people. There, there's not enough of them. Yep. And so how can we not only make the ones you have more efficient, but Allow the business user, allow the guy who really, or the woman who has the question that needs to get answered, allow them to do some of the work themselves. And so this is a class of technology, again, by analogy to uh, the graphical user interface, where we believe we can bring people who always treated data transformation as a technical task, we can make it accessible and actually fun. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, how are, tell me about the company. How are you guys funded? Are you, are you friends and family right now? Or are you, where, where are you at? Yeah, so we came off campus uh, about 20 months ago. and We're talking to friends, talking to seed funds, and we're talking to VCs. And Excel came out and funded us with a series there uh, last June. And then we, we let our friends in at that time. Um, and then Greylock came and did a preemptive Series B with us last year that we announced a couple months ago. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're off in the middle of our Series B now, Beaver and away building software and going to find customers. Yeah. How many uh, people work there now? We're at about tw a little over 25. 25. It's, yeah. well, I think you got a good thing going because uh, every company is going to need more data. And even if you have the data, you need to see more insight into it, right? Um, does this work with streaming uh, sensor data as well? You can do the same kind of thing, like look for this pattern and spit spit out. You know, when the pattern goes off off the rails, tell me about it. Yeah, great question. Um, in principle, yes, and in practice, not today because we're just focused on Hadoop. Okay. Um, but um, one of the research projects that we worked on back when I was doing sensor networks, wireless sensor networks, back in the early two thousands, was called TinyDB. The idea is the world is your database and you just need to issue queries to it. And we were actually able to push SQL-like queries out to these sensors and they would run the query on the streaming data and bring back the answers. Um, the reason I tell the story is that interface looked very much like a database interface. Yeah. And it's the same with streaming data today. So if you look at the tools for streaming data, writing code for them is a lot like writing code to Hadoop or to a database. So for us to generate code from Trifacta for those platforms is going to be fairly natural, and we'll go tackle that when the time comes. Yeah. I bet this would work on log files too, right? I, at Rackspace, we have a lot of log files. <laughs> 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 right, because anytime you want to study how a system is working, and it spits out a log file. Can you bring those log files in and do the same kind of uh, pattern re recognition with that? Absolutely. In fact, our standard demo used to be over at Apache Weblog. And as we went out in the marketplace, we found out that actually most people aren't interested in log files. Yeah. They're much more interested in restaurants and customer records and uh, other business use cases. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so we don't show that demo first now, but absolutely it's a very natural one. Um, have you tried the Twitter Firehose with this? Have you tried it with social streaming data that's you know flowing in? You know, like the, when uh, the Super Bowl was on this last week, there was hundreds of thousands of people talking about what they were seeing. 
can I bring that kind of stream into here and and do things to split out different kinds of tweets in real time? Yeah, so you can, if you land uh, kind of tweet streams and things like that in Hadoop, then it's a pretty natural thing to use us to try to pull some structure out of that data. So it's kind of semi-structured tweets have a bunch of metadata about location and time. And then they also have, as we saw with the comments here, they have vermin, right? They have these hashtags and other things you might want to pull out. Um, so that's pretty natural. Um, and then, of course, if you want to hit the tweet stream live, then again, you're in the streaming data case. There is a very cool piece of open source from a friend at MIT uh, called Tweak Tweakwool, which is a tweet query language, which you can run on the Firehose, which is kind of fun. So in principle, we could target that someday, too. Wow. Well, that was a lot of fun to think about. Um, where, do, where do companies uh, get more info? Because I'm sure the CTOs have some very specialized questions that they might want to ask. Yeah, uh, trifacta.com is the good place to go look. And we've got videos and uh, contact information stuff that you can go poke around over there. Very cool. Thanks right. so much. That Thanks, was awesome. Robert. Great.